All right, so we talked about what last week? It was the first one of the second set of commandments. Do you remember what it was? So the first four are about who? God. And the next six are about, that's about people. It's about man. More so not about man, but about what you do, right? And commandment number five was honor your father and mother, right? Y'all remember that? That was an important one that we kind of walked through. Um, do y'all remember any points from that? Anything that, any points of discussion? Has your household life gotten simpler since we've discussed honoring your parents? Is it now more easygoing? Suddenly everyone obeys and there's no issues at all with children or progeny or any of those things, right? Amen. Let's pray. Mission accomplished. It takes some time to get through things like that. I get it. Uh, but the basic premise is what? Honor your father and mother. Why? Because if you do, what happens? You will live long in the land. And we talked about that a little bit last week, too, if you remember. The idea of living long in the land making a lot of sense because if you honor your father and mother, you're going to heed their information. You're going to heed their teaching and you're going to carry it forward into the next generation. And you're going to carry it forward on, okay? And so you can see those pieces too. Also, it's connected to blessing, uh, just general blessing. You guys can sit next to her. That's totally fine. You're allowed. You are allowed. That is a fine thing to do. Look, I have, I have a, uh, what is this called? A mosh pit. Yes, that's it. That's it. It'll be f- <laughs> the uh, orchestra pit, the mosh pit. Yes, it's happening. Um, so anyway, uh, you honor your father and mother, and then you're, you will live long in the land. You will receive instruction from the Lord. All those good things happen. Um, any other things? Uh, how's your Sabbath thing going? Has your Sabbath thing gone well after we've spent four weeks talking about the Sabbath? Any big, fun, new things y'all are doing on the Lord's Day that you're trying out? Anything? Cool. Actually, try not to stress about the rest of the week. Let's try not to stress about the rest of the week. Yeah, that's a big one. If you can manage to pull that one off, that's for sure. All right, guys, today we're going to be going into uh, the second of the latter six commandments. It's going to be thou shalt not. Do you all know what it is? What's the sixth commandment? Murder. There you go. We're not going to murder people. Now, let's pray, and then we'll jump into today and kind of talk through. Father, thank you so much that you give us this opportunity to read and study your word. I pray that we would do so faithfully. I pray that you'd help us to hold fast to your truths. And that uh, we would learn not just what it means to not murder, but how we should respond to such things going on in the world around us for your kingdom and for your glory. I pray that you would teach us and instruct us by the power of your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the Bible teaches us, if you go to Genesis chapter 4, verse 10, uh, the Bible teaches us very clearly that this particular commandment matters a lot to the Lord. Why? Why? If you remember the story of Cain, this is Genesis 4.10, whenever Cain killed Abel, what what was bringing the accusations to the Lord against Cain? Do you remember what it was? What's the blood of his brother? The blood of Abel was literally crying out from the ground. Bloodshed cries out to God. Genesis chapter 4 verse 10 says, And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. So that means that if we have our hands in um, manslaughter or murder, then the blood of those innocent people is calling out to the Lord against us. It is a witness against us. Are y'all following with me? And so that means that means that murder is a is a very very big deal that we should take very very seriously, and it can be done in a, you know, a thousand different ways. I got a ton of Bible verses here. We'll take some time to talk through the different types of murder that are exampled throughout the scriptures. Somebody pull up Second Samuel chapter twenty verse ten, and somebody else grab First John three fifteen. Second Samuel twenty verse ten. Who's got that one? Just raise your hand so I know you got it. Okay, Terry's got that one. 2 Samuel verse 20, chapter 20, verse 10, and then 1 John 3, 15. Who's got that one? Just raise your hand so I know somebody's got it. Okay, Stephen's got that one. Thank you. All right, guys, so murder can be committed a ton of different ways. Uh, for one of the ways we can see in 2 Samuel 20, verse 10. Go ahead, Terry, read it loud for us. Go 
Good job. That was a lot of very difficult names. You did well. You picked quite the one this time. <laughs> But we can see one of the ways, one of the easy ways that we can see murder committed is, is by the hand from someone, a, a literal killing, a literal execution, a literal death, okay, that's done. But there are other ways. Somebody read 1 John 3.15 for me. I think it was you, Stephen. Stop. Where do you hate? Do you hate with your hands? No, you hate, you hate with your, your heart. Maybe a better way to say it would be you hate in your mind right? More literally. The heart thing gets ambiguous. That's why I'm saying mind. Let's think about mind more so. But yes, I agree. The principle of hating someone in your heart, yes, but it, really it's in your mind. Um, y'all ever didn't, you ever had one of those moments? Oh, I could just get five minutes. You ever done that? Some of y'all, <laughs> you are too holy to admit that you've done that, but we all know you have. <laughs> we all know you have. Uh, but, or you ever plot, maybe it's not that you're trying to kill somebody literally in your imagination, but you are plotting against them mentally. You know what I'm talking about? Um, maybe, maybe we could make this happen and that would really be humiliating for them. Or if we could do this, then that would show them, right? That, that plotting that, uh, I'm, I'm working on getting even here. You've never done that before, right, Thomas? No, Thomas never has done that. He is a holy and righteous man who does not behave such a way. But that is a thing. And if we are hating, which is a mental action, if we are hating someone, then that means we are murdering them in our minds. You can murder with your hands, yes, but you can also murder with your mind. All right, somebody grab John 18.30, and then somebody else grab 2 Samuel 11.15. So who's got John 18.30? Raise your hand for me. It's just so I know you got it. John 18.30, who's got it? Anybody? Amen. Still no hands. That's okay. This is yes, Dana's got it. All right, John 18:30. Who's got 2 Samuel 11:15? All right. The Pattersons have both. All right. Dana, go ahead. John 18:30. Let's see, hear this one. The context here is Jesus' crucifixion. They are lying about who Jesus is, and therefore they are sending him over to be executed. So they are murdering with their tongue, with their words. They're literally sending him away to be killed, and they are guilty of his blood, right? The Jewish people as a whole, we know the Bible teaches that very clearly. They are guilty of the blood of Jesus. In fact, they called the curse upon themselves. Let his blood be on our heads and on the heads of our children and our children's children. They called this curse upon themselves as these particular people, and they even lied about it. They said, if this man were not doing evil, we would have not delivered him over to you. Uh, go ahead, Landon, read Second Samuel eleven fifteen. So they can kill, you can kill with the tongue, you can also kill with the pen. And that's exactly what David's doing here in Second Samuel. David's sending this letter, send Uriah out in front, and then draw back from him that he may be executed. He's not executing him. Now, obviously with David, it started way before that, right? It started with David and his affair with Bathsheba. And then David didn't want his reputation stained. And so he decides to kill somebody. Like just craziness, just absolute craziness. Um, all right, so let's go on. I got 1 Kings 21, 9 through 10 and Deuteronomy 18, 10. Who's got those? 1 Kings 21, verses 9 through 10. Who's got those? Okay, Kelly's got that one. And then we've got Deuteronomy 18.10. Who's got that one? Deut, the Deut, Deuteronomy 18.10. All right, Jesse's got that one. All right, Kelly, go ahead and read uh, 1 Kings 29, 21, 9 through 10. So say, what, what, how are we doing this now? That's, that's a plot to murder somebody, right? You've, you've hatched a scheme. You've hatched a plan. Now you're going to move to execute them. That's your, that's your strategy. That's your, that's your mechanism of murder here is you've made a plan and you're going to let it come to fruition. Um, Deuteronomy 18.10. Go ahead, Jesse. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices their son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, or casts spells. 
Now, did you catch that real quick? I'm going to read mine. What translation are you reading? It's NIV for some reason. <laughs> that pagan translation. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's okay. You're fine. Uh, NIV is not a pagan translation, by the way. The TNIV is most definitely. And if you have the NIV that's after about, I think it's 1989, you, you should question some aspects of it. But NIV in and of itself is not evil. Um, but if you read it, I'm going to take it out of uh, ESV, which also has its flaws, by the way. Um, I'm going to take it out of ESV. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering. Anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens or a sorcerer. What are we talking about here? We're talking about witchcraft, right? Uh, witchcraft, which is very prevalent in Ophelousas, by the way. I think we have three witches in town that I know of just that I know of, and they're all around my office. <laughs> if two more move in and it makes a pentagram around me, I'm, I'm changing office locations. Like, we're, we're moving real fast. But uh, we got, witchcraft is a very prevalent thing here, and it is a, it is a murderous entity. Um, there's one witch, in fact, I'm having an interview with her this Wednesday in town, um, she and I are going to have a little podcast recording that we're going to do together. It'll be fun, I think. Well, assuming I'm assuming it's still happening. She and I made plans. We set the date, so I'm hoping it's still happening. Um, but anyway, but she considers herself a good witch, <laughs> like Linda, if you've ever seen The Wizard of Oz, right? <laughs> she, well, no, she ain't walking around in no sparkles. Uh, but anyway, but the idea of witchcraft means murder, okay? It will only ever culminate in murder. Um, so we need to keep those things in mind. All right, uh, Matthew 2, 8 and Acts 22, 20. Who's got those two? Matthew 2, 8 and Acts 22, 20. Anybody? All the people who read already are thinking in their mind, I'm not doing this again. Uh, you know, like, you got one? Oh, Max is going to do one. Matthew, which one she got, Landon? Okay, she's going to do Matthew 2, 8. And then I need Acts 22, 20. Who's got that one? Yeah. Carrie's got that one. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Who had that one? Oh, Ephraim's got that one. Carrie, you take the next one. All right, so we got Maggie and Ephraim. All the Pattersons being responsible. Good job, guys. Maggie, read Matthew 2, 8 real loud. That's lies and deceit. He has intention. We're talking about Herod here, right? Herod wants to go and find Jesus so that he can worship him. That's lies and deceit. He's being murderous. It's his intention. He's intending to kill. He's intending to execute. Go and find him and tell me where he is so that I can worship him too. We do that all the time, especially in the abortion industry. Uh-oh. We'll talk more about that later. <clears throat> all right. What's Acts twenty-two twenty? Ephraim? Read loud. So St Stephen's being killed by the mob, right? They're stoning him to death. Who's standing off to the side giving his, who's that talking? Who's that giving consent? That's Paul off to the side. He's, he's murdering by approving of the action, by giving consent to the action. This is what our governing officials do every time there's abortion. That it, there is an abortion that happens inside of the state of Louisiana. They're murdering by their consent. They approve of these actions by the way that they have voted in legislation that has gone past. By the way, um, just so everybody has this on the front of their brains, Louisiana has an incredibly strong legal anti-abortion stance right now in, in terms of the actual act, in terms of the actual uh, chopping up of the baby in the womb. We have that. It's in place. It is already being moved against. There were five, I think, bills that just went to committee. I don't think any of them made it out of committee, but five bills just went to committee in order to try and argue for exceptions to abortion in the state of Louisiana, which constitutionally should be illegal here, by the way, because the whole point of what we did back with uh, the pro-life law that we added to the Constitution was make 
it very clear that under no circumstances was abortion a constitutional right in the state of Louisiana. It was, in fact, against the Constitution of Louisiana. Did you know that, by the way, that states have constitutions too? They do. Um, but what they're trying to do now is add extra laws that allow there to be certain capacity to do that. But somebody who knows constitutional law, Stephen, um, will know very clearly that's not a possibility based on the Louisiana state constitution. So it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. In other words, what I'm trying to say is technically... No matter what law they pass, if they don't revise that constitution, ain't nothing supposed to be permissible in Louisiana. You following with me? Okay, cool. But we'll see what actually happens. <clears throat> okay, last two, John 18, 38 and Deuteronomy 24, 6. Carrie, you get John 18, 38. Who's got Deut 24, 6? Deut, 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 Deut. Deuteronomy 24, 6. Buddy's got it. Oh, sorry, no. 24 <laughs> 6. I hadn't heard your majestic voice read anything yet today, so I was going to give it to you. Deuteronomy 24 6 for Buddy, John 18 38 for Carrie. Carrie, go ahead. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. Pilate, but what, what happened? Okay, so Pilate said to him, What is truth? And after he said this, he went back outside to the crowd of the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. But what wound up happening with Pilate and Jesus? What wound up happening? Pilate gave him over anyway. Pilate was like, there's nothing wrong. He didn't do anything. I could tell he didn't do anything, but he gave way to the pressure of the mob. He was a coward, in other words. You can murder by cowardice. Um, Last one, Deuteronomy 24, 6. Go ahead, buddy. Mm-hmm. No one shall take a mill or a couple of millstone and slay it, but that which you ask him a life is slain. Now, this is uh, a little bit of a comparable allegory. Let me try to explain it here. So, what they're saying is whenever you have these communities, they depend upon this millstone in order to eat. So, you don't allow somebody to make a vow to you, make a pledge. This is a part of God's law, okay? God would not allow these people, these communities, these mill workers, to offer their millstone over in pledge. Because if they did that, what happens? Now you got no more bread. Now what's going to happen? You and all your people are going to starve. You see what I'm saying? So God said, no, 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 you can't even do that. So you can also murder by pledge, by promise, by hard heart, by choosing to go against the law of God. God said, don't do this. Why do you think he had to say that? Because people were doing it. (laughs) Because it was a thing that was going on. In the time. So we've got all kinds of, let's just review the, the types of murder that exist here, just that we read, and there's more, okay? But we've got murder that's done by the actual act. We've got murder in the mind. We've got murder with the tongue. We've got murder with the pen. We've got murder by plot. We've got murder by witchcraft. We've got murder by intention, murder by consent, murder by cowardice, murder by hard heart. And I think we can all agree in generally that murder is bad. Amen? Murder bad, don't murder right? Everybody can kind of agree in that particular concept. Murder is bad. Murder is evil. We understand that. But here's the problem, I think. I think that we have turned this into um, platitudes that we say and not into something that we believe in the core of our being, okay? Are you following with me here? It's easy to say abortion is evil, right? You could say that. It's easy to, I don't know, it's not as easy, but it's still easy to go to like a pro-life march. And we walk for a mile. Maybe we lose our Saturdays, you know, but we can go and do that. It's easy to go and um, volunteer at a, at a pro-life clinic. Well, you're giving up your time, but bear with me here. It's easy to, to make a statement. It's easy to do little things, but I'm concerned that what's happening is that we're just saying platitudes. In other words, we're just doing empty words or empty actions. Here's my point. Our understanding of a commit of a uh, our understanding of a command of a commandment. There it is. My tongue was locked up there. Our understanding of a commandment should be measured by our response when it's broken. Okay? Our, and that goes for any commandment. Our understanding, how down deep we really get it, in other words, should be measured by how we respond 
when a law, when, when a commandment is broken. Um, in other words, here's my question. Do we demand a lawful response when a commandment is broken? Do we demand a lawful response when murder is committed? Or do we say, there went another one. Do you get what I'm saying? That's two very different actions, don't you think? Two very different dispositions. If something is evil, and evil all the way down, then we should respond with a demand for justice, right? That, that should be a, a Christian standard response whenever we see murder, murderous acts committed. So if we're just sitting back and saying, man, it's still happening, I don't know, I guess I'm going to go on vacation. I don't think that we're getting all the way down that there are serious problems and serious breaking of God's laws happening around us. Genesis 9, 5, and for your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning, says the Lord. From every beast, I will require it, and from man. From his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Exodus chapter 21, verse 28 so that's, we'll, let's talk about Genesis 9, 5 real fast. That's God saying, hey, if somebody gets murdered, if someone is executed, I will require lifeblood for it, okay? A life for a life. Now, God's standard of justice um, was actually an equal justice system. So um, you ever, you've heard the expression, an eye for an eye? before? Y'all have heard that expression? That's a biblical expression, because here's what used to happen before God put that law in place back in the tribal times of the world. Somebody poked out somebody's eye, and everybody killed him. <laughs> That's not equal justice, right? So God had to set up an equal justice system, and that includes here a life for a life. Exodus chapter 21, verse 28, when an ox gores a man or a woman to death, the ox shall be stoned, and its flesh shall not be eaten, but the owner of the ox shall not be liable. Unless what? Do y'all know? Do y'all know the case law? Now, it, the owner of the ox shall not be liable unless, what? Unless he knew he had a murderous ox, right? Unless he had, and he didn't do anything about it. Because it says, there's, there's parameters given here, like you keep them pinned up. If it gets out and it kills somebody else, that's on you, bruh. That's a manslaughter. That's where we get the categories of manslaughter, even. Uh, Y'all following with me here? God demanded, demanded lifeblood for a life. He demanded it. And that's just murder by animal. How much more so should we care about murder by a human being? Um, now, if we think, just, let's just think on, our, on a cultural level, level, our society as a whole, um, to the most recent um, Christian school shooting happened in Tennessee. Y'all remember this? Uh, how many kids were killed? I think it was six, right? There was six? Three, adults. three children, three adults. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Three children, three adults. But for a little while, the storyline going behind that was what? That there wasn't six victims, but there was seven. Why? Because the media arc that was bending behind it was trying to get the rest of the world around us to look at the shooter as just as much of a victim as those kids were. That's insanity. That's a disregard for God's demands of a just understanding of murder. Now we see that one and we're like, wickedness, that's unjust. Okay, good. I'm glad you got that category in your head. But we need to apply that all the way. That, that response, okay, that visceral, like, hey, we got to deal with this. Oh, that's unjust. That sense of justice that you just had, we got to take that and apply that to murder across the board. And this is where I think we drop the ball. This is where I think we get into to a, little bit of, to a little bit of trouble here. <clears throat> um, we say things like, well, they're not really the antagonist because their feelings were hurt as a child. Have you guys seen the Spider-Man movie? The one Spider-Man, the multiverse Spider-Man, you know what I'm talking about? Where the one that's got three Spider-Men? <laughs> okay, well then I got a case study for you, Olivia. You ready? Here's what happens in the Spider-Man movie. All the bad guys, they're just misunderstood. 
And what happens in the movie? Do y'all remember? What happens in the Spider-Man movie? He just, he's trying to help these poor bad guys. And they literally, this is the wild thing. For some of them, they fix them with like pills. Did you see this? Like it's insane stuff. They, they put together, y'all should, I mean, it's, it's rather hilarious. Confession, I haven't watched it, but I've read the synopsis. So, or listen to it or whatever. But the, the whole deal here is that what they're trying to do is communicate to us that there's no real bad people, right? There's just misunderstood people. And therefore, there's no what? There's no justice. You get it? There's no justice as a result. And so we as God's people got to look at the guy killing somebody else and say, hey, look, maybe you did have a rough childhood, but God demands blood for what you've done. And I'm going to fight to see that God's justice is carried out insofar as you can. Now, I recognize ain't nobody in here in the Louisiana government. <laughs> okay, so just about the button that we've got is to call our state reps and blow up the mayor and, and talk to our elected officials. Like, that's what we've got, okay? But that's what, something that we should do, something we should flex. Um, the past week, whenever I found out that the, um, those five abortion laws that we were talking about at the beginning of class, four, five, I can't remember how many they were. Um, when I found out that they were going up on the docket for the Louisiana House of Representatives and Senate and all that stuff, I didn't even know they existed. Um, I blew up my state rep, my, my buddy, Dustin Miller. We're not close. Just fully, full disclosure here. Um, but I texted Dustin because I have his phone number, and so I know I can get in touch with him. Um, he and I have had some very sharp disagreements in the past, very sharp, very pointed disagreements because we don't agree on all elected policies, obviously, because I'm a weird guy that believes the Bible. But I did that for one purpose, so that he knew that I was paying attention. Do you get it? And if that's the button that we've got to press as Christians, then I think we've got to press it. <laughs> I'll text it to all y'all. But it's true. If that's the button that we've got to press, then I think that we need to press it. it. None of us are writing laws. None of us are writing legislation. We don't get an opportunity to go into the chambers. Some of us are too busy to go to the state whenever they're doing all these things or local meetings. I understand all of those pieces. But the button that we do have, we need to press it. We need to make sure that we're working as hard as we can to, uh, at the very least, wash our hands of the blood of guilt. Do y'all follow with me here? This is an important piece for us to be thinking about. <clears throat> All right. We also don't apply justice consistently, and we need to fix this particular piece. Um, for example, let me give you two examples. There are people with the opinion um, that Donald Trump should be executed for treason. Did you guys know about this? That's floating around the Internet. He should, he should be tried and executed for treason because treason is a high crime, and in the United States, it does warrant execution. I don't know when the heck the last time was we actually executed somebody for treason, but that exists. And there are folks who argue that case on the Internet. And now, it is probably just a coincidence, though, that they hate him and are Democrats. But, you know, it, it exists. It is a thing. Now, in the same vein, there was a bill in Louisiana that was attempted to be passed that would prosecute women who had abortions as murderers. HB 813. This was about eight months ago, I think. Okay? And the people who wanted Donald Trump executed for treason did not want that bill to pass. In fact, it wasn't only them. In fact, it was the Louisiana Southern Baptist Convention that moved against the bill. In fact, it was the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission that was affiliated with the nationwide Southern Baptist Convention that moved against this little bill happening in Louisiana. All this bill did, HB 813, all it did would say, if you have an abortion and you carried out the choice, you were guilty of murder. That's it. And all that is, is a logical conclusion. Are y'all following with me here? If that is a baby, and it is a human life, which the Bible teaches clearly, go read the Old Testament, and you kill that life, you are responsible. That's all that bill was. And it was wild to me Louisiana right to life moved against it. The Louisiana Baptist Convention moved against it. The Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission out of the nationwide Southern Baptist Convention moved against it. Before those three entities got involved, it was going to pass the House. It was going to pass. Before the Christians got involved, it was going to pass. That's insanity. And the 
blood of those babies are on those people's hands now. Do you follow with me here? We, we must treat God's laws and God's equity of justice as the standard. This is what I'm talking about. If we say murder is a sin, you shouldn't murder, but we can't carry it to its logical conclusion, then we don't believe it in our hearts. You got me? If we say murder is a sin, it should not be committed, and those who commit murder are guilty of murder and should be executed, but we can't carry it because it's icky. Uh, I don't want to make somebody else a murder. Oh, then we don't actually believe it all the way down to you. Right? All right. Questions? Yes, sir. Absolutely. 100%. Anybody responsible is a murderer. Mm-hmm. Well, the only way that that would be able to happen in Louisiana is if somebody was, honestly, if a doc was coming from outside of the state, because there's no licenses, or they're doing it illegally in the first place. So, but yes, I agree, they all need to be prosecuted. Now, whether or not HB 813 actually included doctors, I'm not sure. I know that it included mothers, specifically, that elected it, and it included fathers that forced it. Do you get what I'm saying? So in my logical assumptions, I would assume that doctors that performed it are lumped in there somewhere too, but I I don't remember the actual verbiage of the bill. I think the current law that we have covers doctors. The current law in Louisiana? Okay. So there you go. So that's already done. So that would make sense then that they were trying to hammer it down a little bit farther. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Oh, I don't, I don't even know about this case. Oh, yeah. So there are times whenever you have to say due process, right? Because you don't know. And so that is, that's why we have a court system, right? Because we need due process to happen. Um, I'm not saying let's get a mob together and go wreak justice ourselves. That's, no, don't do that. No, we don't need... We don't need to make a posse, (laughs) okay? That's not what we're trying to do here. But we are advocating for justice, and we do need, we do need um, due process, especially in instances where everything, all the details aren't perfectly clear. See, that's one of the problems with the internet, though, is all of a sudden everybody is a legal expert, and they have all the information on the case. No, you don't. You don't know nothing. You don't know what happened. You don't know the details. You need that judge and that jury and those lawyers to do their job, and you got to sit back. That's part of why I always say I care far more about what happens in my town, my neighborhood, my backyard than I care about what happens all over the nation. Because by the time it's been filtered through Fox and CNN, who the heck knows what's true? <laughs> you know, Who the heck knows what's true? Even uh, honestly, like watching, I know sometimes you're like, but I could see the security camera footage. Yeah, but I've been involved with enough altercations to know that those security cameras, uh, that doesn't tell you enough. Right? That doesn't give you enough detail, enough information about what's actually going on. So due process is important. What'd you say, buddy? <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah, you got to be very careful about those different pieces. So um, anyway, due process is a great thing. Um, if one of y'all got tried for murder, I love you, um, but I'm not going to attempt to enter a guilty or innocent verdict here on my side. We're going to lean into the courts and Pray for justice all around. Amen? Okay, cool. Any other thoughts? This is fun, isn't it? All right, so here's the point I'm trying to make. Murder is evil. That's an empty platitude. Abortion is evil. I keep saying abortion because that's the one that is very much on all of our hands right now. Okay? Abortion is evil. That's a platitude. If, the, if we believe the law, we should articulate not just the law, but the consequences thereof that the Bible lays out, right? And if there is someone who is guilty of murder, then they deserve to be executed, okay? That's, that's an important piece that we need to draw. And the only way that you can carry that disposition 
There are also other crimes in the Bible that you're guilty of execute, you should be executed for. But the only way you're able to carry that disposition is if you believe in eternity. But because if this life is all you have, execution's a terrible, awful thing. But if we believe in eternity as Christians, then we can minister to those in jail who are on death row more effectively than anybody else can and attempt to lead them to Jesus so that they can have an eternity of hope like the thief who died on the cross next to Jesus, right? We have got to get out of the mindset of looking, as ex- looking at execution as this awful, wicked, evil thing. Oftentimes, it's a mercy. Can you imagine? What do you think would be worse? This is just a thought experiment for you. What do you think would be worse? Living 70 years in a cinder block cell, in isolation, being fed three hots and a cot, well, probably actually more like a a hot and a half meals I'm talking about, a meal and a half and sleeping on a cot for the rest of your life, or to be led to the Lord, receive the due penalty for your crimes, and enter into glory. I got to tell you, if I'm picking between the two, I'm picking option two. But because we're a a more mature society, we're more developed because we're a bunch of Darwinists, we decide that it's fine to just let people rot in a box for 80 years. That's far more wicked, okay? Far more, far worse. Life in prison? Oh, now I'm going to start talking about the justice system. I don't know if we can put this on the internet anymore, but look, listen, dead serious. The Bible sets up parameters for justice where the victim of the crime is the one who receives the recompense, okay? If, if someone commits a crime against you, you're owed the money. You're, you receive restitution. That's what the Bible's precedent is, okay? Now in the society that we live in today, if someone commits a crime against you, then they pay who their restitution? They pay the government. They pay the government. And you pay for them to go to prison for the rest of their life. How messed up is this, man? That's wickedness. So now the victim carries this double burden, and you can try to go into a civil suit with them after the fact to attempt to get some restitution, but guess what? They're in prison. (laughs) They have no means, which means you have no option. You have no ability to take recompense. You have no ability to take restitution in a situation like that. That's wicked. That's wicked. God's system of justice is far better than the system of justice that we have today, but it only makes sense to Christians who believe in eternity. It won't make sense to the secularists, because for the secularist, this life is all they have. You get what I'm saying? All right, any other questions about that? Go ahead, Landon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same defense against uh, the conquistadors going into South America. Okay? So here's the deal the Canaanites were wicked and evil people. They participated in sacrificing human beings, babies, all kinds of things. They did atrocities beyond what we could understand. There's a reason Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. Because it wasn't just because he didn't like him and he was a racist. That's the woke version of that story. He didn't want to go to Nineveh because he thought they were going to kill him. Because they were wicked and evil people. Same principles apply for Canaan. The Canaanites deserved it. God's a covenantal God and he pours out judgment. Not just on the one, but on the covenant. Okay? And God gave them so much time, too. How long did they live in that land and have opportunities to repent and opportunities to follow the Lord? Uh, Romans 1 makes it clear that even creation itself reveals the glory of God. They should have known, but they refused to repent. Their hearts were hardened. They were wicked. The same thing happens with uh, the conquistador invasion of South America, or at least the way the story is portrayed. Um, The atrocities that went on in the Incan and Mayan empire were absolutely insane. They would cut the hearts out of a man while he was still alive and eat it while it still was beating. And people are like, mean whiteys bringing Christianity down here. Like, what the heck? That's crazy. Do you get what I'm saying? 
But because we've gotten so far away and we've embraced, um, I would maybe even like subconsciously, culturally, the, uh, the woke agendas into our daily arguments, then we fail. We're not able to say things bluntly and directly. Say that to your history class next time. They deserved it. <laughs> you said that. Good job, Dave. Dave's going after it. Good job, buddy. That's good. They deserved it. 100% they deserved it. And then the kids are like, no, uh Okay, well, let's talk about all the atrocities that went on in these nations. That's phenomenal. Crystal, I saw your hand up a second ago. Yes. It's wicked. We've lost, because we have left the Bible, this is, this is it, y'all, I'm telling you. Because we have left the biblical standard for justice, our nation as a whole continuously enters into a downward spiral of wickedness. Instead, if we want to really repent, we have to believe God's law all the way down deep in our hearts, so much so that we are not just saying empty platitudes like abortion is evil, like murder is evil. Instead, we're demanding justice. Are y'all following with me? All right. I'm out of time. I'm only halfway through my notes. We'll probably talk more about this next time. But murder is a very important concept. So here's the, here's the fact I want to drill into our brains here. It's not just about stating the law. It's about demanding justice when it's broken. Got it? That's the piece. If we really believe God's law all the way down, then we don't just recite the Ten Commandments, but rather we demand justice when they are broken. Okay? All right, let's pray. Father, thank you so much that you give us this opportunity to study and read your word. I pray that we would do so faithfully and that you would help us to articulate it well and obey you in all of your goodness. Father, may we never look at your law as burdensome, but instead may we look at it as gateways to freedom that we may live your ways as your people and see your kingdom come. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. Thanks, guys. See you all in about 10 minutes.